Can we do it? We did it. Uh -huh. Hi, everyone. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing good. Can you see my whole big head? I sure can. Okay. I can see all but the very yeah. top of your, your crown. Maybe I need to scoot back. All but your, oh. your glorious crown. Oh, you're not. Or my real? <laughs> or my uh, story? <laughs> you like that I turned you into a cop? <laughs> oh, your sound cut out. There. Mm -hmm. I can hear you now. Good, 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 good. If I start sounding garbled, I'll simply move. Okay. And I found out something. What? I'm, I'm in the front room, and um, there's a router place in the corner. Yeah. And the only thing is, when I set it up there, then my wife can't watch uh, Real Housewives of Orange County. Yeah. Without it being you know, buffered. Yeah. So yeah. not I'm, to not to air out her garbage. Right. It's okay. I've watched many reality TV trash shows. So. She's on Real Housewives of Miami right now. I despise them. And she's been watching the Sex in the City yeah. thing oh. over and over. She binge watches. And you know, I would love to um uh, you ever seen Saving Private Ryan or Band of Brothers? I not the whole thing, no. Well, there's the scenes where they have the Panzer tank, the German tank, and it's just ominous and terrifying. And they they show the tank, the turret going yeah. and level off, and then it goes boom like that yeah. and just explodes. The building. I want to do that to the stage set of the real <laughs> Sex and the City. I would yeah. love it. Just a war scene where I'm coming in with uh, artillery and just boom, 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 boom. I don't like it. I, yeah, I think the Sex and the City show is trash. The at least the original. I have I mean, I imagine the new one's probably even worse. But it's it's all horrendous. I uh, my mom watched it growing up, and so somehow I managed to not be overly mm -hmm. scandalized by it. That was one of those shows that I remember my mom watching. And so then I grew up and I was like, I should watch it. And the more I watched it, I was like, this is terrible. Yeah, it's garbage. On um, the Real Housewives series, my wife, uh, she watches every one of them. Oh. And of course, because I like to spend time with my wife, even if I'm just laying on the sofa, playing on my phone, you know, yeah. I like, like Tamara, you know, Tamara on Real Housewives Orange County. I don't watch Real Housewives. But, but I mean, I'm not watching it, but it's on the TV. So you, you know, I pick up on everything. I know, I know everybody on every one of them except the Miami girls. I just despise them, and the the ones in Salt Lake City, I I like watching because there's a lot of Mormon stuff on there. Oh, okay. You, you learn a whole lot about about them, and uh, it's interesting their culture and where they live and. Salt Lake City and how religious it is there, even though it's Mormon and they're they're all ex Mormon and they trash the church, then they go back to talking about the church. So, um, yeah. you know, so are we live yet? Yeah, we're live. We're on. Okay. You want to tell people who you are? I think you should do it kind of at the beginning and then again at the end because there are going to be different people filtering in and out. Okay. So go ahead, tell people who you are. Oh, <laughs> Catholic for rednecks, and I've been invited to talk to my very favorite, Desiree, and I won't try to say your last name. I'm not good at the, the Spanish names, Mexican, Spanish. I'm not good at mm -hmm. it. So you can say your last name. I'm C. Fuentes, Desiree C. Fuentes. I don't think I've actually put that on Instagram, but now it's there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what's funny is I'm sitting at the foot of uh, the bed here, mm -hmm. and my son's dog, Callie, the German Shepherd. Mm -hmm. and I never did. I never could figure out why she would watch this, and now I realize she re she's laying there. She thinks I'm talking to her. No, she just sits there for the whole hour on YouTube, or Instagram, and 
and looks at me and I realize she really thinks I'm talking to her. Hey girl. She yeah. yeah. Well, I have to say that this is the first, this is not the first conversation you and I have had. We have had many conversations in the past, but on John's YouTube, where he is by the same name, Catholic for Rednecks, he talks to a bunch of people mostly about their conversion stories. And your son says hello. Hey. And uh, right. uh, uh, we've talked about some other things too, since I've been on numerous times. And the idea for today's talk was righteous anger because I had texted John about that topic not that long ago. Um, and then I wound up talking to my own priest about it on the same day. And so it became kind of a larger conversation. And I think it's something that we deal with on Instagram, whether you're somebody who posts and creates yourself or you're somebody who just responds in the comments. So I want to talk about that with John. Yeah, but Do you have I thought that righteous rage would be a good term. Yeah. For rage? Yeah. I've been, I think uh, of anger. <laughs> Uh, righteous anger. Um, do you think that that uh, most people have this picture of Jesus as being a sweet fellow, a sweet, a sweet man, kind and sweet? Because that's the impression I get from the whole world. And yeah, I think most people have heard the Jesus is nice version or the Jesus is nice story, and there are not as many. Uh, you know, Jesus flipped tables conversations happening in the same spaces. Well, my my thing is, I'm going to go ahead and say it and maybe make people mad. Uh, Jesus was a, a a hard man. And the way he presented his message and talked to people in public, he was very direct. Mm -hmm. And at times, I think, very humorous. Me and my son, Brian, we do the daily reading every day mm -hmm. which all Catholics should do I hope everyone does the daily readings but uh they're funny they're, they're we find humor every day in the readings and a lot of things Jesus said to me are hilarious I mean if you just visualize being there you know raises someone's daughter from the dead and he says don't tell anyone yeah <laughs> it's hilarious and uh, uh, an apologetics thing is, you remember a lot of times he would heal people, and what would he say? Go show yourself to a priest. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was heavy on the priesthood, even though he was God in the flesh. And just, you know, he used slang, mm -hmm. and, and the Pharisees felt insulted many times when he talked to them. He would bring them into the conversation, even if he wasn't talking to them. They were standing around. He brought them into the conversation. It was not flattering. Yeah. yeah. And he called them out. Yeah. So why, why can't we? Why can't, he wasn't missing his words. He was direct. Yeah. Why can't we without being called uncharitable? I don't think people have the best understanding of charity. And uh, uh, I, I don't, it's always annoying to talk in generalities because there's somebody out there who's like, well, my story is different. And we're talking in generalities okay generally speaking this is true whether it's a vast majority generally or a somewhat minority generally there are a lot of people who just don't understand what charity is i think they're some of the same people who think that um when you when you affirm the church's stance on same-sex attraction for example people will say you're mean and that you're being divisive and it's like it's not mean and divisive like the they're there's what you say and there's the intent. If the intent is to hurt, then sure, it's mean and divisive. If the intent is not to hurt, but to love somebody, then it's loving. You might not like what's being said. You might be somebody who's either an ally or who you know, deals with same-sex attraction themselves, but it doesn't change that the intent isn't to hurt or harm or whatever. It's out of love. And I know we've had this conversation before, but I don't think I've ever said it on here before. I've talked a lot about how things escalate in real life. And I teach this to my kids all the time. I used to work in a bar and there was one gentleman there who was hitting on a lady and he's buying her drinks and he's a little bit liquored up himself. And from the get, when he sent that drink to her, she was like, not interested. You know, she gave the polite, like, oh, okay, thank you. You know, don't want to be a mean girl thing. Um, but he just kind of kept it up and then like, he's talking to her and he won't leave her alone and all this stuff is happening. And 
I don't know if the guy who was with her was her boyfriend or was her, like, just somebody who was there with her. But she eventually started becoming more and more direct verbally with him, like, leave me alone. I am not interested. And he just didn't get it until this dude who was with her clocks this dude in the face. And then our bouncer has to carry him out. And you watch that whole thing unfold. And, you know, aside from the, like, party that wants to, like, eat the popcorn and just watch (laughs) this S show. (laughs) there's actually some wisdom to it where it's you know it's not like he sent this this drink over and she gave him like the bird right back you know that it was a polite mm, but also i'm not gonna look in your direction because i'm not actually interested in this you know and you just go and go and go from there and i think once you start to hit those points where you're punching somebody in the face or telling them directly dude i'm not interested leave me alone some people will respond like, well, you don't have to be such a B or you don't have to be so rude or like violence is never the answer. And it's like, where were you for all the stuff that happened before this? You know what I mean? That is what we see happening with Jesus. And that is what we see or what we should be doing rather in our lives. You have to have the necessary escalation, but some people just don't get it until right. like in the face. You know what I mean? And so that's, that's sort of like a bunch of different ideas in one story of, the need for escalation, how some people just don't get it, how to handle those things. Because even though that guy wound up getting punched in the face, if you started with punching him in the face, that would have been wrong. And so context matters. Like there's there are pieces to the righteous anger puzzle, but I want to give you a chance to respond to that. And then I'll say what um, you and my priest basically said when you both said essentially the same thing about what righteous anger. Me and you both kind of like, watching true crime or listening to true crime podcast and i know that you used to like crime junkie for they got woke mm-hmm. and me too I, I used to listen to crime junkie podcast all the time and then they got more and more woke to why i quit listening but they have a, um they have a lot of good points on there about the necessity of rudeness yeah especially a single lady or a lady that's alone yeah uh, a lady on a business trip, she's walking down the the corridor of her hotel to her room and there's a guy following too close. Mm-hmm. And natural the natural reaction for most women is to be nice. Or yeah. to, to be uh to not be a B I T C H. Yeah. And that can get them killed. Because the only response that a person with bad intentions has is they they want to they they only understand the same amount of force uh, that they get in return for what they're putting out there. Mm-hmm. They they don't understand. No, thank you. Yeah. But they understand. I get the f out of my face because yeah. that's why they talk. And it's, I, I see the same thing when you're dealing with people online. They. Mm-hmm feel like they have the right to talk to you, to insult you, to insult your beliefs. Because, you know, it's like on my channel, if you come to my page, Captain for Rednecks, it, just the name of my page reveals a lot, okay? Right? Like if you built a bar and the bar said, Redneck Honky Tonk Bar on the outside of it, you yeah. would think a bunch of business people would be filing in there wearing their dinner attire you know, for pleasantries and talking about, you, you know, you think of a biker bar or, right. you know, so, um, you know, if a guy's following you around the store or at the gym, you know, sometimes girls go to the gym and there's a guy, this is always there and almost in their space. Mm-hmm. You know, the only thing they understand is rudeness. Yeah. They don't get it any other way. You can't be polite. So, you know, I believe sometimes just, like for females, just nip it in the bud, you know, mm-hmm. turn around, stop following me, you yeah. know, just be loud and rude. They understand that and it works, but they yeah. don't understand anything else. Yeah. So that's my, that's my little pitch. Yeah. I've had, I want to say two, well, definitely two interactions recently on here where I would say the righteous anchor came out. And the first one was the one I texted you about, um, where, I posted on, um, what was it? I don't know. I think it was a Saturday that Pope Splainer sweater video. And I've deleted the comments. So if anybody wants to go and look at it, you can't, sorry. But somebody basically got got on there 
and typed a super long paragraph saying that um, the Catholic Church is stupid, the catechism is stupid, the typical pedophile stuff, something disparaging about the priest. And then she called me insane for what I said. And bear in mind the caption of that video, I liken the Pope to my father because he's our spiritual father. Um, he, or I, and I said, if you were to come for my dad, I would come for your throat. And so I was just not in the mood <laughs> for this today. And so I definitely went right back at her and I was like, you can get the heck out of here. Like the way that she was speaking, she sounded like a seed. And so I was like, mm -hmm. get out, you know? Mm -hmm. And then she came back and started trying to claim Christian charity to me. And I was like, look, you don't get to claim Christian charity when you said all of the things you right. said. And then the conversation went on and it sh I told her like, this conversation's over, you know? And so she started hopping on other people's comments and I'm like, you just want attention, get out. And so I actually blocked her and I almost never, ever block people. I would rather let people have their conversations, you know, in the comments unless it's exceedingly grievous or they're starting to harass other people like that. And it's like, yeah, you can go away. Um, but that happened. And then the other one that happened recently was somebody, and I, that one's, this one's still here. So you can go read this one if you're that nosy. But someone called me a liar on my page. And he tried to couch it in terms of like, you know, well, we're friendly. So that's why I said that. Because somebody else called him on calling me girl. He called me girl. And uh, he was like, no, it's because we're friends. For the record, we were not friends. We were messaging each other, direct messaging each other, uh, voice messages, talking about things. And his, every conversation with him basically was, I have these questions and I would give him some answers. And he'd be like, you know, I just don't accept that. Like, I just, I don't see it because, and then he'd sort of repeat himself. And so that was the extent of our conversation. We're not being friendly. He's just somebody who has clearly mastered the notion that people who get argumentative and emotional, particularly in certain name calling and playing into the whole logical fallacy thing, those people will become losers in the eyes of the audience, right? You want to keep your calm. You want to remain as level and steady and respectful as possible because even when you're wrong, if the person you're talking to isn't doing those things, you come off as looking right. And so he's really, really very good at that. Um, but he called me a liar and I don't think he was expecting me to come back at him as hard as I did, but I don't take too kindly to what he said. And what I had initially responded with was I quoted him and I said, so you're calling me a liar after I've established myself as a teacher, which to paint context, we had also had a private uh, conversation talking about how the sins of a Pope are worse than the sins of a Bishop are worse than the sins of a priest are worse than the sins of the laity because the with great power comes great responsibility, if you will. When you are of a certain level, to be sinful is way more scandalous and you're gonna be punished harshly. And so when I said that, I was just pointing out the obvious, but also like we just had this whole conversation where you and I know my beliefs are, if I'm lying, I am in worse trouble than if my, anyone else were to be lying because I, I would be misleading 50,000 people who are looking at my stuff, you know what I mean? So I came at him and I was like, do you want to stick with that? Or do you want to walk it back? And then I pointed out that the rest of his response read like somebody who probably read my caption, but didn't look at the resources I gave him. And his initial reply, I don't think he read them, but then I think he skimmed them. And what his responses amounted to was just repeating the same charges over and over again. And then saying like, yeah, well, they're responses, but they're not answers. Like, what about this thing? He was talking about like St. Jerome, for example, disagreeing with the topic at hand. But if he had actually read what I had posted, he would have seen that that was addressed and it was discussed. And it's not something that's, that's a, uh, how do I say this? It's not math, you know, it's not like two plus two is four and there's no arguing it. It's just, this is history, this is how it is. You have to understand it um, or just sort of like sit with it. I, I can't make you understand that sometimes people disagree. Sometimes you just have to, grow on that front and figure out that that's how that works, even in the church. His, um, his belief in fairness is that because the church has this teaching of papal infallibility and being the one true church and being God's church, basically, that somehow it's supposed to be right 100% of the time. Um, but I, I don't feel like he's considered the fact that literally no church is right 100% of the time. And even so, church, capital C, and church, little c, with the people, 
are two different things. The big C church is right. The little C church can mess up and the people can mess up. Even popes can mess up, you know, but yeah, his whole thing was just, he, I don't, I don't think he was open. And I said that much. It was like, I don't think you're actually open to the, our, the Roman Catholic position. I think you're just sort of playing polite because you've realized the benefits that you can get when you play polite. But in summary, I'm not playing these games with you. Like, we're done unless you want to come back with an apology. Because even in those few exchanges we had, not once did he walk back that he called me a liar or apologize. And then he concluded, I believe, by calling me a Pharisee. He didn't outright say it to me, but he did tell somebody else to be wary of Pharisees. <laughs> so <laughs> apparently I'm a liar and a Pharisee on here, according to him. But that instance and the one prior to it are those perfect examples of righteous anger. And I want to say the thing that my priest said to me, which is that righteous anger, you know, Jesus is angry. He flipped tables. He did. He like, cracked the whip, all that stuff. But his anger was always towards the injustice and not towards the perpetrator of the injustice. And so he said he cracked whips, but he didn't hit people with them. And that's, that's essentially righteous anger is you have to, there's a perceived injustice and perceived is key. When you perceive it, you either have to recognize mm, this didn't really happen. So like, I need to chill out. It's probably some kind of like trigger for me or my perception is accurate it and there's an injustice here and I should be angry it's like that is the natural response just like when my child cries I run to them or when they're adorable I'm just like ah, I'll squeeze you you know so anger is a natural response and you can harness it and use it for good and the good way to use it is to use it against injustice but not against those who perpetuate that injustice and so in my circumstances I was defensive of my own honor and defensive of the church. Um, but I think an issue with doing that is one, a lot of people don't realize that that's the definition of righteous anger. And so they struggle with that element of it. And that was what I texted you about was I didn't have that definition until we and my priest and I had talked. Um, but also I think, especially for women, I think we have a hard, harder time being righteously angry because we're told we need to be gentle. We need to be sweet. We need to be all of these things. And I think that those things are inherent to womanhood, but I also think being able to stand up for yourself is inherent to womanhood. But I think whether it's cultural or just misunderstanding or like familial or whatever, people have this misunderstanding of when a woman is direct and forward and defensive, she often gets accused of being like hysterical or B-I-T-C-H-Y or rude or unladylike or whatever right. it is and so i want to hear your take on that element of it of specifically female righteous anger um you're right when a woman stands her ground she's called a bitch you know she be a real bitch how many times have we heard that yeah. you know yeah. or you know that's just uh, my wife is uh, uh well she has been like a corporate um, executive or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, when she has to confront men or, you know, that's, you know, that's what she's going to be called when she has to do something verbally correct or redirect or in a meeting, mm -hmm. uh, someone gets up and starts saying something that isn't quite true. Uh, a lot of men think they could just keep driving right over the the point right over the woman because she's a woman who are you to talk to me like that you know uh you're out of your place yeah speak and you know i i just i look at um i look at school teachers okay i've always my entire life i grew up afraid of teachers at school mm -hmm. just you know and I, I just realized that in the past year yeah. Um, by the teachers and why is that because the teacher was uh pretty much absolutely controlling my life mm -hmm. because anything she said to my parents to get me in horrible trouble she had my destiny in her hands i was afraid to get yelled at to get sweet yeah. um sent out for licks just i was afraid of being wrong 
She let me know when I was wrong. She would correct me verbally in front of people, you know, at the blackboard when you're doing things. I just, just so I grew up terrified of teachers. And um, I've really realized that. So when I go to school, when I teach, and I'm a full-time substitute, I'm there every day teaching mostly K through five, you know, kindergarten, right? And my first few weeks on the job, those kids ran over me. I mean, you wouldn't believe how bad they would run over me. I mean, you would think, you know, that they'd be scared of somebody that was a police officer in the, in the military and older. No, heck no, they ain't scared. They ain't intimidated by nothing but brute force, verbal force, loud voice, all this stuff. And, you know, I'm sitting here in my class, and my class is like on kindergarten cop. They're running all over me. They're out of their seats. They're disrespecting. They're back talking. And then I just listen next door and across the hall yeah. where you got the mean, the mean teachers. And yeah. it's so quiet. You can hear a pin drop. And they're yeah. ordering discipline. And because of that, she's able to teach. There's order in the class. There's no fighting. There's no disruptions. And so uh, women are very good at that. When they want to be yeah. direct and all, you know, you, you've heard female prosecutors, and they have they have to be like that. They can't be sweet and kind. And uh, the uh, I was with this kindergarten teacher the other day, and she told me that or I was talking to her the troubles I have because I have grandkids, and mm -hmm. it's in my, my nature to be a granddad, and I mm -hmm. want to be the good guy and I want everybody to like me and to be sweet and compassionate and all and I was saying but it don't work it don't work in a classroom because you mm -hmm. give them and they take 20 miles they will run especially in the inner city yeah need to go f off and use that word okay mm -hmm. they will hit you I've been hit they will they will physically attack you they will call you names and cuss and uh, so you have to be, you know, you have to let them know who's boss. So she said she's been teaching for 20 years. And she said her very first day at school, she got out of the parking lot. And she was very excited as she came in through the parking lot. And, and the principal was going out to his car. She passed him in the parking lot. And she was smiling at him and said, good morning, Mr. So-and-so. And he said, get that smile off your face and do not walk into this building smiling ever again. You're at work. Act like it. Oh my and it hurt her feelings. It really hurt her feelings and shook her up. And she learned, um, I can't be sweet. It, they, they're not going to let me be sweet and kind. Yeah. Right? And sometimes when you can get a reputation of, of, uh, in debates and such as well uh you, you know it's like trump trump no matter what people think of him he said what people were thinking mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and, and he knew that yeah he's like the first politician that would ever snap back that i yeah. everybody else is diplomatic political politically correct walking it back rephrasing it not him. He would just hit back harder. Yeah. You know, you remember when they they asked him about him using the term anchor baby? No, I don't remember that. You know what anchor baby yeah. is, right? Yes. Well, you know, the reporter said, don't you know that you're offending people using that term anchor baby? And he goes, does that hurt your feelings? Like that. And the guy said, yes, it does. And he went, oh, next question. People got people got to know that you can't talk to Trump like he's just some chump. Yeah, he will go off mm -hmm. and stand his ground and and fight back. And people aren't used to Christians doing that. Yeah, they want. That's, that's what I don't love about the whole nice Christian girl in particular thing is the obvious like, well, if you don't do that, then like you're mean and divisive. But it's just ineffective for so many people, like going back to that escalation thing, like some people just want 
a diplomatic conversation. Sounds like you, I get comments plenty of times. Where people are like, I know this might sound kind of rude, but I'm not trying to be rude. I'm genuinely wondering. And so then when you respond genuinely, they're usually like, wow, cool, cool, thanks. But then there are some people who just do not get it, whether it's because they refuse to get it or because they're so like spun up in their preconceived notions of what this means. And if you're stuck on your like nice Christian person, I never get angry, never be perceived as me and, you know, always worry about what you're saying and how you're saying it and every possible outcome that could happen from the stuff you say. I mean, I do think you should be careful with your words, but I don't think that you just have to shut down when somebody pushes back on you. Like there is a line between turn the other cheek and letting yourself be walked all over. And I'm not somebody who wants people walk all over me. <laughs> um, but that said, the other, I think in fairness, there's another side to the whole, like, you know, when women are mean, they're called names. I think also, well, this is a conversation I was having with another friend a few weeks ago. Um, women, for as nasty, especially physically and brutally as men are, women, I would honestly say, are even more nasty with their words. You know, it's like a spectrum where men can hit you in sort of this space, like, and this includes physical. Women can also be physical, it doesn't hurt as much, but the spectrum for women is like way larger. And I think that's why women can be so venomous towards other women and towards other men. And you you can just be like shocked at the stuff that comes out of a woman's mouth. And it's like, a guy would never think to say this because no offense, I don't think they have it in them, but, you know? And so there's this other side of it too, where like you can be righteously angry, but you also have to be aware of your limits. Like, okay, so perfect uh, parallel for men and women. Women need to know where to watch their mouth and not say the thing that cuts deep. You know, like I've been the person who said the thing that cuts deep. There was somebody in my fourth grade class who was held back. So instead of going to fifth grade, she was in fourth grade with me and she was just running her mouth all year long. And at one point I, she was saying something to me and I turned around and I called, I said, her, I called her by her name, but I don't want to say her name here. So I'm going to pretend her name's Ashley. And I was like, you know what, Ashley, <laughs> at least I didn't get held back a year. I'm smart and I know when to keep my wits about me. And she immediately closed her mouth, turned around and went to the teacher. And it's like, did she leave me alone after that? She sure did. And did she deserve to hear something like that and get put in her place? Yes. But did it cut just a little deep? Maybe. You know? <laughs> Maybe that's not the thing that you say. Uh, why not? But it could have been. Why not? Why not? I think, I, I mean, as an adult, if I had heard my child said that, especially given all the context, I would have been like, listen, that's a mean thing to say. So don't go around saying it and don't like take pride in it. But at the same time, some people just need to be reminded stuff <laughs> like they need to recontextualize themselves because clearly let their ego get a little bit too big so i don't think looking back on that 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 was the worst thing for me to do but i do think if i had maybe started with that instead of being as patient as i was for the half of the school year that she was like this to me um or if i had been even sharper with how i said it it would have been worse you know and so there's some element of like you have to pull back for the record, my teacher did come over and say essentially that to me, or she was like, that's mean. <laughs> you can't say that stuff to people. But I'm wondering no, Because she knew what this actually was like. She knew she was a total little... I'm, I'm wondering about that. Because show me Jesus being and talking sweet in the mm -hmm. official record. Show me him being sweet. Yeah. Even when the rich yeah. young ruler mm -hmm. came up to him, the rich young ruler... In, in Mark chapter 5, there's only one place in the Bible where it talks about Jesus loving someone. He never said, I love you to a single soul. Mm -hmm. he never said. There's not one verse in the Bible where Jesus says, I love you. It's not there. Yeah. But he, he did respond to the rich young ruler. It says, Jesus looking at him and loving him said. And it was a rebuke. Yeah. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, then come and follow me. 
-hmm. And it says the man looked down and walked away for he had great possessions. Yep. But Jesus knew what the root problem was. And he went yep. right for it. And he said it publicly, called him out on that one thing he was latched on to, his yep. way. And it said that he looked at him loving. He said it in love. Yeah. Um, if your kid's going out in the street after a soccer ball, you're not worried about hurting their feelings when you yell out at them. Yeah. You can love that child. And you're not being make it sweet. I'm just, there's a, a couple of people I've known in my life that people knew, knew if you're going to argue or insult this person in public, he's mm -hmm. going to hit back. Yeah. About 10, 10 times harder than you think. Yeah. And so what did people do? They, them alone. they let them alone. You know, it's like a certain, there's a dog around the, around the corner here. And this, this dog, no matter what side of the street I walk on, he comes out of the, they leave the garage open about two feet, right? And he, yeah. he won't come past the sidewalk because he got an electric fence. Mm -hmm. But it don't matter how I, if I tiptoe or what, he's going to come out at me like he's going to kill me. Yeah. And I've learned, I just don't walk on that part. I don't go that way because yeah. I don't want to upset that dog. Oh, what if he comes across that imaginary fence and just tears me up? Yeah. You think I'm going to provoke that dog? Am yeah. I going to go get in his food? Am I going to go F with him? No, I stay away. And maybe it's just my age, but there were police officers I worked with and people on the street knew you don't smart off to Mr. So-and-so. They, they learned because his reputation preceded mm -hmm. him. And I noticed with Jesus that people would go in mass to confront him. Mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't go by themselves. They'd take their friends. And a lot of times it said they dare not ask him anymore. Yeah. He was brutal. Yeah. He was absolutely brutal. And I just don't see the sweet, loving, and <clears throat> excuse me, I've been sick for September when school started. But um, look at the Apostle Paul who talks about love, First Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Mm -hmm. He's always talking about love, <clears throat> yet look at his responses to people in public and through letter. Mm -hmm. They don't sound tender sweet. He's, he tells people he's going to send them to hell. You know, I'm going to hand them over to Satan. And he even uh, contested Peter and bragged about it, said, I withstood him to his face. Mm -hmm. And there's a story in the early church writings of John, the apostle of love. Mm -hmm. Him and Peter, I think, were at a bathhouse mm -hmm. in Ephesus. Socially, you know, people went and took public baths. Like in England, have you ever been to Bath, England? I haven't been. I've been. <laughs> there and the Romans had built these steam baths and this just things that you did you went you, you know you went to the public bath and you I guess you sat in a hot tub and talked philosophy and politics I don't know but someone said something wrong to John the Apostle and you know what John the Apostle did, did he physically do? beat the guy down yeah that's in church history he laid him out yeah. I just People shouldn't be afraid to uh, slander our church. I would agree, but I don't think that they are because there's been a lot of, oh, what's the word? Wilted flower, shrinking flower, something like that. Yeah. Where into, in order to avoid bad press, essentially, people won't say or do certain things. And I, I will say there's a wisdom to some of it. Like there are some things that's like, it's just going to stir the pot. It's going to do way more harm than good. That's fine. Use discernment. Be intelligent. I don't respond to everybody who charges at me because I'm like, I know that you're not being genuine. You know what I mean? I know that this is just maybe an argument. I know that what you want is to get my goat and get me to like snipe at you. It's not, it's just not going to happen. Like I'm not going to give you what you want. It's a waste of my time. It's imprudent. It's not going to go anywhere. Use your judgment. That's great. That's fine. But at the same time, 
there are there are times and places where you do need to come back and you need to be ready and there's another side of this i think too of like knowing your limits and knowing your strengths and weaknesses and then knowing i mean and then being lazy and not cultivating places that could be strengths right like i have a friend in particular who's very well-meaning and i love her and i think she's actually very smart in here she's just not very good at like getting these things to connect and so then when she tries to articulate these things you just think like oh you sweet summer child yeah <laughs> it doesn't work for you baby it's okay but she knows it and so more often than not she's like hmm, i'm not gonna have this battle like I, i'm just gonna sit here because i'm probably gonna hurt my cause by trying to do it you know she'll try she'll try her best but she knows when to stop but there are plenty of people who are very smart here and here, but maybe they're not, uh oh, someone might be coming in. Someone, I mean, those people might not be as well versed or as well practiced in those things. And so they don't want to engage in them because they're like, well, I'm just not very good at it. It's like, okay, but that's, that's sort of why you should. And maybe be smart and begin by doing it with friends you know, like test that out so that you don't just look like a total idiot and it mm -hmm. bolsters somebody else's ignorance. Um, but you need to work on it. And I, I think the righteous anger is something that we need to work on. Like we need to learn when to be righteously. Francine, stop. Right. Francine. Yeah, Francine. That's my aunt. She's named. <laughs> She's named after Francis of Assisi. Fran, stop, baby. I can hear you. Um, some people need to work on the scale and by not working on it they're being lazy and it's genuinely a waste like it's genuinely offensive to god to be like i gave you this brain and i gave you this mouth but because you're 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 not the sharpest debater at the moment you're like i'm just not even gonna i'm not even gonna sharpen the blade like i'm not even gonna try you know what i mean like that that's an element of this this aspect like we don't want to be angry because we don't maybe we don't know how to be angry but like then you need to intellectualize it you need to start practicing it in your life. Most of us have children. I've been angry with my children, you know, and I always have to go back and think like, was that too mean or was that right? You know, it's, it is a regular part of my talks with my kids, as I said earlier, to talk about like the escalation. Yesterday I got mad at one of my kids because she was being, she was not listening. So I said to take, and over many separate instances, I had basically said, do the thing that I told you to do, listen to me. And the last thing she did was she was vacuuming by like flying across the house and the cord ripped out of the wall. And so I was like, I'm done, you're done, go to your room. But it was a lot, you know, more harsh, harshly said. And um, she wound up getting upset and kind of crying about it. And she, oh my gosh, uh, hold on you guys. She's mad. <clears throat> hey. I love it. You need to stop that. That's over the top. No, my wife is laughing very, 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 very good. That's a lot of things. Okay, I will tell them. Be nice. I don't. Shh. Be nice to Fran. I'm almost done. Okay, you go chill. Stop the screeching. I'm loving it. Anyway. I'm uh, what was that? I love this. <laughs> the hottest. Um, anywho. So she was upset and crying in her room. And then when I went to talk to her about it later, she was like, um, you, you know, I'm sorry for doing what I did where I like flew across the house with the vacuum. And so I talked to her about it and I was like, listen, yes, I'm upset at you for that. But I, you, what you apologized for was this one thing. But what I yelled at you for was all of the stuff that happened before. Right. Because I told you, hey, this is what you need to do. Go get that done. And then it was, hey, you're supposed to be doing this. Focus, you know, like, do this thing and then hey why aren't you doing this do it then blair do it hey quit goofing off i'm tired of your stuff do it hey do you do you think i'm like I, i'm not seeing what you're doing i know what you're doing you're not fooling me do it and it's all of these escalations that go up until i snap at her and she was looking upset when i said it and i was like you know i'm not trying to hit you over the head with what you've done and i'm not trying to make you feel bad i'm trying to make you see like you didn't get it until I yelled at you, but I didn't just yell at you for the thing you apologized for. I yelled at you because you did all these other things. This is just the last straw. You know what I mean? But people 
don't know how to do that and they don't maybe maybe they don't properly or regularly or whatever it is have these internal reviews but they're so important like it's the same principles examination of constant conscience like you need to constantly be checking yourself for strengths and weaknesses and figuring out where you can work better and form better because we ought to be good at and formidable at as much as possible and constantly being smacked in the face by protestants who know their bibles better or by atheists who make these charges at us like uh the wealth of the catholic church and then you just say nothing back it doesn't look like well i don't want to have this argument it looks like I've never thought about this before. I don't know what to say. Uh, and then they win. They're right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And anybody who witnesses, that witnesses this is like kind of scandalized. Yeah. We know better. We should do better. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. And you know, the first part of that is knowing your stuff. You know, I think it's shameful when people don't know their own religion. And yeah. um, I like, uh, one thing I like to do that I learned from John Martioni, if you've ever seen him, mm -mm. Uh, he always said, if we're going to talk about my religion, we're going to talk about yours too. And I'll answer your questions to my full knowledge if I get to ask questions in return. And a lot of them won't do that. They're not going to do that. I notice a lot of Protestants will do everything they can to hide where they go to church. Yeah. They know that their church has problems. Yeah. And the real, the the real fond of jumping on the Catholic Church. Yeah. But they're yeah. they're they're not they're not gonna you know they just don't they are it's like this we us Catholics boldly say we're Catholic. Yeah. You, you ain't gonna see people get on there and say, I'm very proud that I'm Presbyterian. Yeah. Or I'm very very proud to be a Southern Baptist. I'm very proud to be Church Christ, because me and you look at being Catholic as being Christian, as being Jesus, as being the body. We like John of Arc, it's one thing. Jesus, my faith, the Catholic Church, the Trinity, the Bible, the Ma it's one thing. Yeah. It's indivisible. Yeah. You know, the Pledge of Allegiance, mm -hmm. I've been paying attention to that because we have to say it every day. And uh, <laughs> every day we're doing Pledge of Allegiance, it says indivisible. Yeah. Right? What's that? mean this one thing. And, and a Protestant process aren't going to do that they're going to say this well right now the lord has us at this church what do you mean he had you at this church yeah compared to last year he was at that church you know because they're, they're not wanting to identify their relationship with god on a church title yeah but we do we're catholic right. you know so it is a all uh, it is it, you're going to elicit something when you say you're catholic you're elic eliciting something because they want to they want to divide you mm -hmm. it's like my brother he's baptist but he won't say he's baptist he says uh he says i identify as being a baptist you know they um i don't get on there and say i identify as being catholic i say yeah. Is there anything the Catholic Church believes that I'm not a hundred percent on board with? Maybe on a couple little things, uh, mm -hmm. capital punishment. You know, Pope Francis is wanting to give put him in a timeout. You know, mm -hmm. I've had this conversation with you in the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in having them whacked. Yeah, and get rid of them. They're they're unredeemable. You know, and but but I'm not going to on. TV, YouTube, and all that, and trash the Holy Father. Right. Oh, I'm going to submit to it. A respectful disagreement. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. It's not an issue. I'm not going to write a book about it. Right. Tour, but you know, um, I'm trying to think of people that, you, you know, is, is it Jew that says to defend the faith? Is it in Jude where it talks about? Defending the faith, have a ready answer to defend the faith. I'm not sure, I think. Okay, and Paul said to defend the faith in season, out of season. Mm -hmm. okay, in, that tells me when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. I mean, at all times, be able to defend the faith. 
Mm -hmm. I say you got to know your faith. And it's not that hard. Yeah. I mean, mean, you take. I mean, at least it's not that hard to understand the fundamentals. I think everybody should absolutely understand the fundamentals. But like, I'm on here because I was raised Catholic and I didn't know my faith. And that's not my fault. But now that I'm an adult, I have to be like, I have no idea what's going on. But I had this profound experience that was like the Catholic Church is where it's at. And I tested it. And I was like, this is really holding true. I need to pursue this, you know. And every single pursuit I've happened, I've had an answer. There's never, ever, 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 for anybody ever who watches this or hears this or whatever, I have never looked into something in the Catholic Church and not found a satisfactory answer. Not once. I know so many people who have converted or are still sitting in their churches who are like, I have this question. And then when I pressed and pressed and pressed on it, and I, you know, sort of dismantled the pithy answers that I had been getting, it always boiled down to something to the effect of like, well, we're in certain denomination here. Of course we think this. Well, gee, you're sounding really Catholic right now. Why do you care so much about this? Is this really even important for salvation? Like, that's not what's important for salvation. Don't let these little things get to you. Don't worry about it. And it's like anybody who's trying to obfuscate, rug sweep, tell you that you're looking into something too much, diminish the importance of anything, like, that's insane. Yes, there are things that just aren't, aren't that they aren't going to, to affect anything one way or the other. Whether Jesus passed through Mary's birth canal or essentially apparated from outside of her womb is irrelevant to the fact that Mary had him. You know what I mean? Whether she felt pain or she did not is irrelevant to the fact that she's his mother. Okay. But certain principles and beliefs and even even scandals, even things like that, I've always looked into these things and it's always been like, here's the information, here's what I need to know. If something needs to change, it was this. And is it in progress or is it done? It's always in progress or done. It's never like, well, this happened and then we were just like, you know, it's not like we knew that there was a wicked pope and we were like, <laughs> you know, we're just going to rug sweep that. We're never going to acknowledge that that happened because that, that's a bad look. Like, it's history. History sucks. <laughs> but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, My little rant. Yeah, you know, uh, really, there's no, no excuse to be ignorant this time and day because we have Mr. Google. Yeah. You know, you can find out stuff. We have something called podcasts. And there's a million of them. You can learn stuff. You know, my wife, Connie, she all uh, has been interested in the in the founding fathers and the revolution, which mm-hmm. is my spot, my weak spot. And so she's been, she bought these books on tape. Mm-hmm. 1776 is one of them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just because I like being with her, I'll, you know, I'm a captive audience. Mm-hmm. Now, it don't work. It don't work for me with her. If yeah. I'm in something and she's not, she'll put them earbuds in. Yeah. And she's gone in her world. But I, you know, I, because I like to listen to what she's listening to. And it's amazing how much I do not know. Yeah. The uh, founding of our country, the founding fathers, what kind of people they were, why they were doing what they did, why it's important. Mm-hmm. And people say, why is it important? Well, look at the debate today. Yeah. Absolutely important. Yeah. Why do we feel the way we do? Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, and these ignorant Catholics that that say stupid things, you can tell they've never spent 10 minutes studying yeah. papal history. Yeah. Or early church, right? Nothing, just the ignorance. That, this affects your eternal life. Mm-hmm. You can't get it wrong. And you've got an instruction manual right here that tells you everything, you know, it tells you what you need to know. Yeah. And to me, there's no excuse for not knowing it. Yeah, I would agree. And, I think there's, um, there's, what's the word? Some people don't understand how to cross the chasm, I guess. I mean, that was my experience was realizing as an adult that I don't know anything and trying to teach myself, what wound up happening was there was some remedial level Catholicism that I was, I had no idea about. And then 
there were some things like pornography, for example, that I could give you like a PhD level dissertation. I understood how anti-Catholic it was and how just anti-human it was and all the human rights violations and like how it enslaves women and children and all, all of these things. Like I could go on and on and on and on. And I sort of realized I had this really skewed, uneven um, education. And some of that you can attribute to just topic interest and availability of information. But a lot of it was, I wasn't educated and I don't exactly know, know how to be more educated, um, particularly within the constraints of my life. Like at that point in time, I was having babies. You know, I started to really, really dig in after my first was born. And then at the time that I'm thinking where I realized I had this disparity, I had had my second and was pregnant with my third. And that was what pushed me to get my theology degree is because I was like, I've been watching Father Mike for years. I will, help, uh, if I have a specific question, I'll go with Catholic Answers. I'll talk to my priest. I've been listening to Pines of Aquinas, like the original stuff with actual Aquinas. I've been listening to Catching Foxes. Like I've been doing all of this stuff and I'm still just don't, I don't have what I need to have. And so I got a degree. But this was when God put Uncatechized Catholic on my heart. I really believe because I was like, if I have this problem and I now have to go and get a degree in today's world where degrees are insane, I know that there are other people out there who are like that and who are going, I just, I don't even, I don't, I don't know where to begin. I don't know what to do. All of this is going to take a lot of time and you can't get around the time piece. That's just, that is what it is, but you can do things to learn stuff, especially quick little Instagram videos, passive learning. You read this caption, you get at least a conversational amount of familiarity with something. And if that's good enough for you, great. If you want to know more, here are some resources, go look it up, you know, learn more, teach yourself more, ask more questions, dive in deeper. But I think a lot of people just truly, truly, truly don't. It's like there's remedial and 101 Catholicism, and then there's almost nothing until like 400 level Catholicism. There's tons of stuff this way, and there's tons of stuff this way. But this area is the struggle for a lot of people. Everyone needs to have this. And if you you don't have this you got to work on it like it's really important but a lot of people want to get in this space and maybe they don't want to hit 400 but they just want to know more than the average joe and there's like nothing there or at least it's so, it's so few and far between and you also don't even know like books for example i don't know necessarily looking at a book how uh meaty it is and so it can it can just be really really hard and so we should know our faith it's important to learn. It's important to work hard. At the same time, I understand why it's sort of like an analysis paralysis or like a uh, something that's kind of difficult to figure out. But you just sort of have to dive in mm -hmm. and hopefully find people like me <laughs> who are going to help you and like give Pretty. you guys resources to like go. I put all. I put a lot of your stuff on my uh, TikTok and my YouTube channel because. It's, you know, you and a couple others on here have a gift and ability to cram a whole dogma into a 20 second video. Yeah. It makes sense. And that's the beauty of, you know, I used to worry about, you know, where's the Catholic church go? Because I, I have a problem with a lot of priests that mm -hmm. suck at preaching. Yeah. A lot of priests don't teach the faith. They, mm -hmm. they make a few comments of you know about the readings during the homily but teaching the faith i yeah. only know one priest that i've ever heard that teaches why yeah we do why we believe that and that's yeah. father bean down at saint Teresa. he'll do the readings and then he lays them aside and he starts teaching yeah whatever's on the heart and i think that people like you i look at um vanessa with uh, that one catholic girl Yep. Um, Marie uh, Manzetti over there, uh, uh, Catholic Caritas, mm -hmm. uh, my son Brian, Catholicism, and <laughs> like I mean, so really, yeah. big, really big and meaty, yeah. you know, huge, huge topic, and make a a one liner out of it that makes sense. And I, I just, I'm glad that people like you are on here, and y'all yeah. have a lot of talent and you're real gifted at reaching people your age. And I'm thinking, man, I'm 61. I'm, I wish that I was 31 
and had all these gobs of talent and good looks. I could really, but it's just, I'm hopeful. I mean, I, I think Catholic Church is in good hands of the laity. Yeah. You know, I, agree. I, I do. I love it that you can Google Catholic now on social media and get all this great stuff. Yeah. Used to, you couldn't get anything mm -hmm. but black legend propaganda. Yeah. You know, just at least where I live. We've been on officially for an hour now, so I think that's our usual stop time. If you want to tell those people who are still on what you do again, where to find you, all that jazz. Yeah, I'm Catholic for rednecks, and uh, that entails humor, sarcasm, hillbilly, back ass, uh, just Catholic on a redneck level. I'm not Belgian like you are. <laughs> and I young and pretty and gifted i just put it i like the old roofer the old contractor you know it speaks plainly so i Not just all right well thanks for coming on with me all right i'll be back on with you soon okay all right, all right. bye everyone thanks for watching okay. bye, bye bye, -bye.